Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about the code enforcement in this town and if you think the code enforcement officer went a little overkill on what he made the builder do here. So we're pouring a house and garage slab all in one, all the same level. It's 50 by 28 for the garage and then it jogs up, you know, it jogs into a 24-24 back there in the back of the video. It's a four inch thick concrete floor, but you can see the edges are thickened to two feet thick and they taper back up into the slab a good four feet. Now we're, we're on the first truck here. We got six concrete trucks coming here today. We got over 60 yards of concrete we're pouring in the slab. In the first 10 yards, you can see we're just dumping the first 10 yards kind of into the, the grade beam or we actually call it a haunched slab up here. So we're dumping the first 10 yards right in the haunch just to make sure that the forms don't move and if they do you know we can kind of kind of adjust them before we start pouring the slab all the way up to, to top of forms so the code code enforcement in this town and what we struggle with in maine is it seems like every single town we go in the code enforcement is a little different in every single town so when someone calls us for a price on a concrete slab we're always asking them well did you get a, a slab design from your code enforcement officer it's not like it's the same in every single town and that kind of makes it a real pain in the butt when we go to bid slabs now today the builder is the one that actually set the forms uh, he did it all the excavation the grading here he also did all the prep work he laid the styrofoam he screwed the styrofoam up the face of the forms a two foot piece of styrofoam on edge eight feet long up the face of the of the forms and then you know he hired somebody else to come in and do the radiant heat in the slab but he laid the wire mesh for the radiant heat to be tied to he put the two rows of rebar around the outside edge so i mean this this slab isn't going anywhere the the plan got changed slightly it was supposed to be a frost wall with a floor inside it but when they started digging down they hit ledge down there a couple feet and they didn't want to have to blast the ledge to get the frost walls in so the the, the design of the slab was just changed to a I guess a two foot thick haunch slab like this and you know a lot of the towns we go into will set up slabs where we only have to use one two by twelve so the edges will be twelve inches thick up into a six inch slab and then other towns we go into the code guy wants them sixteen inches thick you know up to a six inch slab and then we'll we'll go to another town and he wants them eighteen inches thick so I mean it's hard to justify just what is right and what is wrong. I guess the most important thing, number one, is the subgrade. You know, you want to make sure you got a good gravel subgrade, compacted, you know, very hard. And that's, that's like priority number one with, with uh, good drainage, you know, slope the landscape and away from the slab. But as far as the slab design goes, I mean, it's just crazy up here in Maine on all these different towns. And, you know, we'll, we work we work 60 minutes to 90 minutes sometimes away from the shop and there's i don't know how many how many hundreds of towns that covers in our area so it's just really really crazy to be able to do a concrete slab and not really know how to price them until somebody calls up the code guy and a lot of these towns in maine the code guy is just like part time and he only works a couple days a week this is what we hear from a lot of the homeowners and the builders. So he only works a couple days a week. So you got to kind of schedule stuff on his time, which makes it a real pain in the butt. And then some towns, you know, he wants to come look at stuff after you get everything formed up and ready to go. He wants to look at it before you pour. So, and you don't really know when that is sometimes. We, we usually just take a picture and ask him, you know, is this good enough we can just take a picture and send it to you? Do you actually need to physically come out on the job and look at stuff? I don't know, what do you guys, what do you guys have to deal with where you're from? Is it something similar or is it pretty standard no matter what you do, no matter where you go? We do have a state law that mandates, you know, code for slabs. But it just seems like these guys kind of, they use their opinions on what they think is best sometimes. Sometimes it's really overkill uh, as far as I'm concerned. And then, uh, you know, the basic minimum I think should be a 12 inch thick edge up into a six inch slab. Especially if you're using radiant heat, you know, put your two inches of styrofoam under everything. At least in Maine, in our climate, we want two inches of styrofoam under everything. 
and then uh, you know then if you want to do your radiant heat fine if you don't then just put the wire mesh to it the rebar around the edges that's that's probably the basic minimum right there now we've got the garage all screeded bolt floated and we're moving on to the house part here we're on dump just dump truck number three gonna the truck number four the driveway was really skinny so we can only get one truck in at a time and it was pretty long too so the guy had to pull away from the pump truck he had to rinse down get out of the driveway we had to back the other guy in get him mixed up so it was probably probably 10 or 15 minutes just doing that in between trucks which really slowed us down but all in all it wasn't too bad this is late in the fall it's kind of cool it, we did start really early we started at 6 a.m pouring this in the morning we're using as you can see we're using the battery operated vibrating screed to screed most of this a lot of pipes and stuff on one section of this so we go around the pipes and you know the kitchen and the bathroom area we shoot a lot of grades using the using the uh, self-leveling laser everything's flat here too he just wanted the builder just wanted everything flat he's going to install his own anchor bolts but getting back to the laser so we shoot a lot of grades with the laser in the middle and then we strike off our pads to get everything really nice and flat and then we we do the same thing around all the pipes and stuff in here we we shoot grades all the way around the pipes to make sure the floor is nice and flat around the pipes and then we strike stuff off if we have to use a smaller hand screed around them then we do that just makes things a little easier a little bit faster um, so when they go do their flooring later on no matter what they use for flooring the floor is really nice and flat and the flooring lays down really really good and easy is what we heard that's why a lot of people like to hire us because we're so fussy putting these floors in and then when we go to finish them too you know there's a little trick to get them flat as you finish and I'll show you that a little bit later in the video but this is a good shot of how just how long this slab is <laughs> crazy but a lot of houses, you wouldn't think of it, but a lot of houses and garages are built this way in Maine. A lot of people don't want to, they don't want to do the foundations. They just want a single story slab to live on. They don't want to have to be walking up and down stairs. Uh, and there is a lot of areas in Maine that have ledge under it, especially as you get closer to the coast. They don't want to have to blast to put a full foundation in or even a frost wall. So they'll just decide to pour their, their structure right on a slab like this. But that took a lot of concrete. It took 20 yards of concrete just to fill up that thickened area around the whole outside perimeter of this. You know, when 20 yards of concrete at about, let's say, 200 bucks a yard, that's $4,000 worth of concrete just to fill those edges. That gives you a good shot of how we strike off the pads in the middle to give us something to go by. So there's definitely no guessing going on. There's, this is exactly how all the pros do it right here is they shoot these grade pads when they wet screed concrete they strike off a pad they can you can strike off that pad by hand like what we're doing with a 14 foot screed or you could use the vibra screed to do that a lot of guys do them either way both ways are good and then you can see we're, we're mag floating the pad around the outside edge even with the top of the form and i'm double checking those forms as i go because we didn't set them so I'm making sure those forms are nice and flat as we go, I'm not just taking the builder's word for it. Um, and then, you know, I mag float them to whatever level I need to. Just so happens these were really good. The guy did a really good job setting these forms up. And then, you know, here we go, coming down, bringing the screed and the concrete down, getting around these pipes. Luke's bringing that little middle section down with, with a five foot screed. That bar on the vibrating screen is only 12 feet. That's why, you know, in the slab's 28. So even if we was to make a, uh, just one single pad down the middle, you know, it's still a little bit of a stretch with that 12 footer to try to reach the middle. So we decide to make two like that, just make it easier on the guy running the vibrating screen. And then as you can see, Luke's over there with the grade stick in the laser receiver shooting pads all the way around that little bond out. And that makes sure that, that that area right there is really nice. And then we'll just screed around that by hand rather than dragging the vibra screed up there. So that was truck number five. We're waiting for truck number six. Here's the end of truck number six now. So 62 yards this took total. 
And we use the 3500 PSI. We got, there's actually microfiber mesh in this too with the water reducer. The, we use water reducer in all our mixes. So we can pour actually a pretty, a pretty loose slump without hurting the strength of the concrete. And we're just finishing up this last piece using the 14 foot screed coming down the other edge of that fifth truck. That fifth truck was setting up really good. So we decided just to screed it off by hand so we could get really good down pressure on the outside edge of the screed, make sure that area was really nice and flat. And then Harvey's gonna finish up with the bow float. You can see there's some leaves coming down. The wind was blowing a little bit, blowing a few leaves here and there. And we had to really deal with that a lot more as we had to finish. You're gonna see in a minute, it was kind of like rain and leaves. And that's always an issue here in Maine in the fall. There's usually like a two to three week period when you know, the leaves go from being, being uh, really nice to look at on the trees to where they really start falling off especially on days where it's really windy or it rains. This was, this was about an hour after we got done that last truck screeding and bow floating that last truck. Concrete was setting up pretty good, even though it was kind of chilly out. Once the sun came up, things started warming up a little bit. There was a lot of edging to go around. You can see all the anchor bolts that the builder, the builder put all those anchor bolts in right where he wanted them at the height that he wanted them at. We just let him do that. A lot of times we'll do it, but we let him do it since he was right on site anyway. And then there wouldn't, wasn't going to be any complaints about those. <laughs> you can see now, this is a good shot of what was happening in the, with the wind and the leaves. And fighting them in the fall can be a real pain. I'll tell you what's worse than fighting the leaves, though, is when you have a big big uh, pine tree right next to and, and the pine needles start falling down. Those don't blow around quite as easy as leaves do. With leaves, you can see how we're gonna uh, fix this problem here in a second, I'll show you. But with pine needles, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tougher, they're so fine. You can, now Darren's in the back, he's got our big DeWalt battery operated leaf blower. And he's just kind of working his way across the slab. He's, you know, he's, he's hand troweling around the pipes as he goes. So Luke doesn't have to stop and do that. And, the, you know, the wind was blowing in all different directions. So he's just trying to keep the leaves out uh, away from Luke as Luke power trials. So Luke's not grinding in any leaves in the surface. He had to run back and grab another battery right there. And sometimes it just takes two guys like this on a windy day when there's a lot of leaves. One guy, one guy just kind of clearing the slab of the leaves <laughs> while the other guy does the power troweling. Now one guy, you know, Darren and Luke are really experienced finishers, and this is a pretty good sized slab actually, but one guy that knows what he's doing with a really good power trial, this is MBW's power trial, can finish a slab like this all on his own. As long as he's got, you know, another guy to go around and do his edges for him, then he doesn't really have to stop. He can go from one end to the other if he needs to. And then, you know, if he has to stop for a little bit and let the concrete set up, he can. Or he could just turn right back around, come right back over the slab again, depending on, kind of depends on how warm it is that day, how the sun's hitting it. Wow, look at the wind there. And the, and the wind does dry out the surface a little bit too, so you just got to keep an eye on that as you're power troweling. But we really like to blend in the edges with the hand trowels really good. We like to make our edges really smooth. So when somebody shows up after the slab's all done and they take a look at the slab, the edges of the slab look just as good as the power troweled part. And the first impression is, wow, what a, what a really nice looking finished slab this is. And we're getting down to just about the end where the slab is, is almost ready to saw. We ended up, I didn't get it on the video, but the boys did end up putting saw cuts in this right after they got done power troweling. So they put one down the middle the long way here, and then they broke it up about every 10 feet you know, going going left to right here, all the way down the slab. So they they cut this up really good to help control any shrinkage cracks. And then you know, then it was basically left up to the builder. After that, he was going to give it a few days to cure up. And then he was going to strip the forms off. Now, when he strips his forms off, that's that two inches of styrofoam stays right there on the edge. And then 
What I believe the code enforcement's going to make him do is also lay two feet of styrofoam on the outside of the slab down towards the bottom of the footing, tapering away from the slab to help even give it an even more frost protection after the thing's backfilled, you know, and after the house is built and the garage is built. So it's got really good frost protection. So I'm not saying the slab design was bad. It, it was actually a really good slab design. You know, if I was building on a slab, I'd probably want one like this too. But it was just like, it was a lot of work to get this thing prepped to where it is today. <laughs> and then, you know, to hire us, you definitely want to hire a professional crew to come in and pour something like this because you only want to, you want to make sure it's done right the first time. Having to go back and fix something like this afterwards, uh, that would be very costly. Now what, what we're gonna do now is we're just waiting for the last little bit of this to cure up. We're gonna buzz that with the power trowel, get the power trowel off the slab. We got a little crane on the back of that pickup truck that picks that power trowel up, puts it back in the truck, and then we're gonna, well we, we got what's called an early entry uh, concrete saw that can cut concrete when it's really green like this. I guess you could call it a green cutting concrete saw. It uses a diamond blade and that goes down about you know, an inch and a half, two inches deep down in the concrete. We take special consideration into not cutting any of those radiant heat tubes, that's for sure. That's why those are left on the bottom of the slab when you're gonna saw it. And then, uh, you know, we pack up and we get out of here. This will be it for us today. So let me know what you guys think about the code enforcement here, what kind of issues you guys deal with. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet. Thanks for watching, come on back.